Let's see. Hey, what's up, guys? It's uh, Rick with Flip with Rick, and I am fortunate to have my good friend Jonathan Rexford on the line with me. And uh, for those of you that don't know Jonathan Rexford, um, I've known him a long time. So he's been doing this, I think he's been doing it longer than I have. So I started back in 2003. And just so you guys know, Jonathan's one of the guys to this date, whenever I have a question with like a subject to deal, um, anything that's like non-conventional um, flip property, I usually reach out and um, for full disclosure, I usually meet with him because me and Jonathan are probably like 25 miles apart, 20, 25 miles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we work and collaborate together all the time. So um, this business is about relationships with people that actually do the business. So, um, and we've done a few projects together. So um, without further ado, um, this is Jonathan. Say hello to everybody and tell them, tell, you tell them your kind of story. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Jonathan Rexford. I am real. I've known Rick for quite a while. We met at a local real estate investor group together. I've uh, been doing it a little bit longer than Rick. I've uh, been buying, building, selling, and financing houses since about August of 86 or 87. I have to kind of go back and take a look at it when I did my first deal. Uh, and that's pretty much my name to fame but uh as rick had mentioned we're very close just like him i'd rather do this in person with him and so forth we always hang out time goes by when you work when you're talking to an investor we'll we'll sit and look at our watches and said oh this is only gonna be 30 minutes and two hours later we're still sitting there talking yeah. so uh it's always good to be able to and, and chat so, guys a funny little story on this is i do prefer the face-to-face -face meetings it's uh you know we, we're automating this world too much but um I have a, my son just turned 20 and um, how old your son, Jonathan? 21. Yeah. So we we're both kind of going through, um, you know, the, the, the kids, you know, get through their, their, their official schooling. And you, those of you kind of know like Zach's story and Jonathan's got his son hustling, doing all sorts of fun stuff with real estate. And uh, it's just kind of funny how our story aligns like in so many ways. And, uh, so I know Jonathan's a big family guy. And for those of you who know that I always go back to the why you got in real estate. I, I did the, the, the corporate race world and I decided to take control of my destiny, took a risk, got into real estate investing. And now I can do things and control my time with my family. And then it's just fortunate. So I run a small family business, which I know Jonathan does as well too. So mm -hmm. just a little tidbit, because most people who work with me, are kind of the opposite of scaling. Like how can we maximize what we use now without like risking our fi uh, family finances, which leads me to the conversation today. I'm um, subject to, I am not the expert on it. Um, I just know when they're there and the op I can identify the opportunity, but for full disclosure, like I go in, I, 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 did, I dove through every one of um, Jonathan's courses and uh, like they're, wa they're wonderful. So, um, why don't you just give uh, a little bit of a plug on like what you do in your current course. And then we're just going to, we're just going to go on a teaching moment on uh, subject twos. Well, uh, just as everybody, you know, you kind of graduate to an area of where you're teaching and uh, that's kind of where I've, where I'm at right now. I run and operate one of the largest Facebook groups out there that is just solely specific with, uh, with subject two, And that is the Facebook group. Uh, subject to, we've got about 17,000 people in that group. Uh, I do have a small little coaching platform that we have. It's called the 20K Club, uh, where we do individual uh, individual group coaching. I probably do a little bit more individual than I probably should because that does take a little bit of time. I'd rather just get on a phone and get rid of it. Uh, so, so I'm trying to take some of that time back. But, you know, we do help people uh, through workshops and so forth that we do inside the 20K Club to teach them about subject to and owner financing and lease options. But that is primarily what we do inside the group itself. But, uh, you know, we're here to talk about subject two. It's my favorite subject. Cool. So let's just start off with the basics. Like what does subject two exactly mean? Okay. Like when you say subject two, can you just like break it down? Cause a lot of people get it confused. All right. Well, let's, let's define subject two as the investor language, because if you go to a, regular purchase and sale agreement, it's going to be subject to what? Subject to inspections, subject to 
uh, whatever you need for verification. And that's exactly what we're talking about here when we're being investorees. When we're talking about subject two, we're actually asking the seller to leave the loan in place. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking over the mortgage payments and having the seller deed the property to us. Now, the biggest key factor here is that for, for, for consideration with subject two, we are not going to go in there and formally assume that mortgage or qualify for that mortgage. The mortgage and notes still stay in the seller's name, but the legal title of that property transfers to us. And we continue to make the mortgage payments, protect the seller at all costs. Even if you can't make your own payments, you always take care of that investment because that will always take care of you. Okay. So talk to me about the, the philosophy, the theory of why, in my opinion, I think every investor should at least have this strategy in their portfolio. Like, how do I make money doing this from day one till the very last day till the property? So walk me through kind of how that cash flow works. Well, on generally, when we're a property subject to, we're either going to, you know, let's just kind of back up. The subject to is an acquisitions model. You know, we're buying the property. Now, your dispositions are going to be the same normal course of your regular investing. It could be for renting it, rehabbing it, and flipping it, uh, you know, or holding it for cash flow. In my business, I want to hold it for cash flow at, at, my, age of, at my age currently. So what we're doing is we're collecting a little bit of money up front. Could be a form of a, uh, an option consideration, or it could be your first month's rent. But we're primarily going to be... Uh, making a cash flow on that property anywhere between three to seven hundred dollars per month per property that is kind of what our averages are that we try to shoot for sometimes we'll get higher depending on the size of the property but we also when we're paying on a mortgage for amount of time we have that pay down of that amortization rig and over the years that loan balance gets lower so if you are collecting more than you owe at some time whenever that thing does cash out you do get a nice check at the back end so you've got multiple paydays there I got it. Okay. And then um, let me ask you, um, so talking about your, your typical like real estate investor, if you, what's like the, I guess the words, the avatar type of house that these work best for, like, does it work best when the house needs a complete gut job and a rehab or we look at it like nice, pretty homes, like it, I mean, say, is there a point where the repairs, if they exceed a certain number, you're going to have an uphill fight on this? Well, that's going to be based on what your potential ROI, return of investment that you're going to get on a property. I'd rather, I'd rather, instead of saying what the perfect avatar is on a property, I'd rather say, let's take a look and merge the two avatars together, both from seller and both with property, because you need both, you need both of them to be able to make it work. Otherwise, it doesn't work at all. You can have a junker property that needs a lot of work that has has a low mortgage balance. Well, that would be a lot cheaper to take over that property subject to than it is to bring in hard money financing, you know, from an equity lender or so forth. That's going to be really short term. So you can do that fix up and flip. So I'd rather see, see a position that where you can take over a property subject to. Now, personally, I like to have something in where between 85 to 95% uh, loan to value on a property that needs no work. So my magic, uh, formula that I like to stay into are properties that have been sold within the last three to five years mm -hmm. that do not, that don't go back further than 2012 because they really don't much work at that moment. And I don't have a lot of out, I don't have a lot of cash outlay going into it. And if it's a three to five year old loan, they've got some pretty neat interest rates in those areas, you know, anywhere between three to 5%, depending on the type of loan that it is. But the biggest thing of it is you must be able to talk to that seller you must be able to find a seller that is in a need to sell, not want to sell. You know, and you and I have had that discussion many times uh, on the major focus in that area. So let, let's talk about the, um, the ideal seller, because I, I, I think a lot of problem is real estate investors spend so much time beating to try to get the lowest and the lowest price. And uh, shoot, I go back to my Carlton Sheets days. Um, I learned originally from uh, Peter Conti, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really intrigued. I started out, this, what really opened my eyes was the, the initial concept of, okay, I can take over this guy's mortgage, um, give him a few bucks up front, get, get a downstroke, get him positive cash flow, and then get paid for the next 10 years. 
-hmm. like super sexy. So I, so let's give you an example. I, I go to a seller's door. Um, I offer him 90 grand. Um, he's meeting with three other buyers after me and he wants like 98, 99. And the house is in perfect shape. Actually, we have one of these kind of going on um, today. I just had a discussion with Zach, mm -hmm. actually uh, not too far from your neck of the woods. How could you, so here's the only thing is I know, uh, hold on one second, I'm gonna pause this. So um, here's, the, here's the only technique I learned and you can, you can critique me, okay? Um, when we, we can't get our cash offer, and then we switch over and they say, hey, listen, if we could do this price, I'd be happy. And say they're moving to another, I like when they're moving to another country or it's an investment property because I know, um, and you can talk about the financing's not like they don't need that credit from that. Um, we just simply say you open to a creative solution and pause. And either uh, Zach will come back, says they're open to it, and then I reach out to the paperwork and a lot of times I'll call you. <laughs> And then like you get specific on how you want to take it down and then you give me a list of everything I need to do. But um, I guess to you is like, what's like all these real estate investors are going out trying to like, what's the lowest and the least you'll take. And I love your strategy is where like, why don't you just kind of give them this target price? You're going to have the best offer. Um, but that's where I kind of get stuck. Are you open to a creative solution? And, and I found out the other day they go, tell me more or they go, are you crazy? <laughs> I, I just need my money. <laughs> so that's kind of where we start. And then I've taught people to do it, but like, I want you to expand and take it. What's the ideal client and what's the conversation you have with them? Let's just assume you've gone and gave like a low cash offer and they like, I can't do that. Okay. Well, first and foremost, before I'm in their living room, we've already had pre-qualified them that they are in a need to sell. If they're, they are in a, they want to sell where the wholesaler or where the low cash offer that they can solve their situation. I'm not their guy, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm there for a reason. And that reason is they must have a non-monetary reason of why they're wanting to sell. Okay. That's the biggest thing right there. Something besides the reason for them wanting to sell a house. They need, you know, the reason I need to sell is because I need to go to X or I need to get to X, whatever it could be death of a loved one, marriage, divorce, whatever that situation is. So we're focusing on that situation and trying to solve that situation. The, the, the guy that comes in there making the low ball offer, the thing that he's thinking about is all cash, all money. So guess what this, guess what wholesaler just did? Wholesaler just planted that seed into the seller's mind. Now, so they're saying, oh, there's three more coming through our, through our door who's the same person. I'm just, I'm a different guy. Yeah. You know, the way that I approach it, I said, so, Mr. Seller, if you're, if you are a creative offer, I might be able to give you exactly what you want for the property and be able to get you to go to X, you know, whatever the situation is. And do you find that like a light bulb goes off when you can like, cause everyone's telling them they can't get this and you go, yeah, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so where do you go from the conversation from there? Cause I th think that's where a lot of people get stuck. Well, we, you know, sometimes I'll bring in my seller presentation. If they haven't watched it on a video or so forth, I have a little flip chart presentation, but they, we've normally, we have focused on the pain of why they are there, you know, because if they're moving to Tennessee, they can't make two mortgage payments or make a rent payment and so forth. So make a, I'll make a little soft pass at them and I'll make a simple suggestion like this. I said, Mr. Seller, if I'm able to make you payments, make your house payments, still get the property sold, would that work for you? Yes. I'm in the living room. Yeah. I'm in the living room or we're doing something, what we're doing here. So we're walking through that process of what that would look like. We may have to give them a little bit of moving money, you know, $1,500, $2,000, or what my favorite phase is. I mean, my favorite phrase is what can a property afford to pay as an investment? Because ultimately I don't like reaching in my pocket as you do. I don't like reaching in my pocket to give them money for the house. So I'm going to raise capital against the property. And that's going to be part of our disposition. So I'm going to give Jonathan props. He came up with the line. I use it quite a bit. And he taught me this probably what, five, seven years ago, probably further back. Um, kind of like, you know, when the shit's hitting the fan, so to speak with, uh, you got an unreasonable seller and you just kind of look them and just say, listen, John, 
let me see what the house can afford. And that's it. And it immediately takes it away. Like it's just an asset and we gotta see, stop taking this personal. I gotta see and every time I've used that, I get zero response. They just kind of go, oh, yeah, well, I guess, you know, it kind of puts, puts a perspective on it. So I give you credit for that when it worked well. Yeah. Worked well, well, the thing of it is, Rick, is that if they're selling a home, now let's talk about that. The definitions here, home and house. Home is where they lived in. This is my home where I've been in for the last 29 years. It is my home. I like my home. I know where every single drywall screw is in this house. But the house that we own, the house we have up the street from here, that's an investment property. So what we're doing is when we're talking to the seller, we're trying to separate in their mind from home to house. Because whenever they're planning to move, we want them to have the vision that they have already left, that they have already decided, you know what, this guy here, I like him, I trust him. I know what he's going to be doing, and he's, a, he's my huckleberry. I want this guy to take on my property. Okay, so you've done enough of these deals. Um, I, I've done some, not nearly as many as you. Mm -hmm. So what, put me through the mindset of a seller that would sell to you. Just give me the quick bullet points of the benefits to them because you see them because obviously I, I assume speed's a big trigger. Mm -hmm. But if you walk through the benefits, so maybe the guy got relocated or he's dealing, he needs to be closest to his mother for an illness. Mm -hmm. And I assume he's got to make a quick decision. So I assume you have like two or three bullet points that really kind of like goes, okay, it solves this problem. Because I think a lot of times real estate investors don't understand exactly. They think cash solves everything and it, it, it doesn't all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I've been there. Right. Well, first of all, it is speed. You know, I can close the same day that I bought, that I make the offer. The so, same day. Same day. I, That's I've done. I've done many the same day. You so know, most of the fast cash guys, honestly, like the, the the three to seven day guys, it's typically thirty if they got all their ducks in a row. Yeah. So. Well, the difference is, I I do my own title work. I can prepare it. I can prepare the deed. I can prepare everything. Put them in front of a notary, and we can close it. You know, that same day. Okay. I can have an, I can have an entire closing package done in about twenty minutes wow. uh, from from my computer. But that's me. Okay. Somebody starting out, I don't recommend that because if you if you cross your if you cross your eyes and dot your t's, you're going to get in trouble. Okay. And uh, so certainly that is one of the ways it was. So speed is number one. Yeah. Uh, number two is is just knowing the comfortability it is is a huge benefit because if you're able to take the emotional because it is emotional selling a house. We've all had houses that yeah. that we still remember. We remember our worst deals and we remember our best deals. Exactly. You know. I'm still in recovery from my worst deal, you know, and I'm, I'm still there, but you know, the best deal is what I re was what I replaced that memory with. So the whole idea is, is to separate the emotion. So those are the two right there. You're able to solve a problem right there. And then to me, that is the biggest higher problem. net value in the long run, higher net value. And if we have to give them a note for their equity, that's, that's, you know, again, it has to be able to solve their problem. Otherwise, if the market can do it, subject two is not the option. And I've been in many living rooms where I thought subject two was the best option. And I sit there with my little yellow pad. I don't have the big one like, a, like the regular yellow letter guys do. I actually sit down and I write down the numbers and I will sit there and say, Mr. Seller, it is best if you contact a real estate agent because I'm not here to serve you in this, in this fashion. Because the last thing you want to do is to do that deal and have that uh, and have maybe a financial counselor such as the brother-in-law to tell them, Hey, you could have got more money. Guess what? That, that seller is going to be a pain in the neck for you. Yeah. You know, 30, 60 days from now. Yeah. So the guys, the reason I'm talking to Jonathan is if you're going to be a complete real estate investor, it's okay if you want to start out like as a wholesaler, but you're, you're going to come across a lot of situations where wholesaling is not the best fit. Like we are all completely different. Me and Jonathan, are different as night and day in like a lot of aspects and we're identical in a lot of things. So everyone's different, what you eat for dinner, which, what you do on the weekends. So, but it takes time to learn it. If you just think you're going to do everything wholesaling, I, you guys know, I still work with real estate agents. I have a real estate agency and there just comes a time where you want highest and best offer and you're, I'm out. Like, here's what we're going to do. And we call someone, we send them right there and wait for them to show up. Right. But um, your strategies, I love it because it, it actually will maximize the most money. The problem is people have a tough time 
first of all, understanding the concept because it's frightening. So get an education, work with someone, Jonathan's Club, how much is yours a month? 20 bucks a month. 20 bucks. So um, you're crazy not to do it. And number two is you just, you have to figure out how to have as many weapons in your arsenal because the more people you can help, which I think you'll agree, the better you'll do in this business. Absolutely. If you somebody, let me tell you what, and I tried this to me. If you try, tell me what happens when you try to shove somebody in a subject to that doesn't really want it. You get a buyer's remorse <laughs> and you'll go to contract, you'll order title, you'll prepare all the yeah. work and you'll get the brother-in-law call or you'll get the call that you're just like, Oh, I did all you're, this. Work. You're never really selling subject to, I'm going to tell you either the shoe fits and you're well armed and educated or to please like, don't do it. Or if you've identified it and you don't know what to do and you don't have Jonathan in your backyard, you need to like sign up for yeah. <laughs> the 20 clay club or something because you got about a day or two to kind of figure it out because yeah. if they're, they're going to sniff you out if you don't know how to do it. Okay. So let's do this. I think we got the theory. Um, we've talked about the type of house. We've talked about really the type of sellers uh, mindset that would do this. So the big question is like, how do you find these deals, Jonathan? Ah, uh, that's, they're everywhere. Driving for dollars is one of my favorite ones. Now I love expired listings. It's just that with my model, I only focus on a couple zip codes, but I love driving for dollars. And, you know, we drive just like you guys do. We drive, but we're also looking for high consumer stuff. I'm looking for the bass boats, the Ranger bass boat out front that's cost, you know, $100,000. The two, the two $100,000 motor homes. I'm looking for debt. I'm also looking for properties that are in newer subdivisions. You know, fortunately, we've had a, a, a growth in our area here on the Treasure Coast, Rick, that we've had new subdivisions. Some of the older subdivisions that went under, they're now we've seen a resurgence. Well, these people have the same problems as everybody has, has had since the beginning of time. So I'm focusing in these smaller, newer neighborhoods where I'm mailing to. Like I mentioned, my direct mail is very small. I have a small targeted list that is focused on that two to three year loan period, you know, because I want, I want the newer loan, but I want somebody that is, that is needing to sell fast, you know, and that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the magic number. And also I still get more than half of my leads through referrals. Yeah. That's my biggest one. Okay. And let me ask you, does, does HOA scare you away or it's just part of the business? It's just part of the business these days. I used to avoid them like the plague, but we've got an HOA on every corner these days. So a lot of people, uh, from what I see, get into HOA. I, it's as nice as you think that house is. A lot of times, they really can't even afford to buy it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, because the, sometimes when they lose their job or something, that HOA will sink up fast. Yeah. Um, real quick, if a um, you ever deal with a house that's in foreclosure with like subject to, is there a point of like no return? I, we, I don't want to go all the way into it, but sure. like, when do I go? Uh, you know, Rick. I'm, when I'm looking at that, I'm looking at what the arrears are. What is it going to cost me to reinstate this? And how much can I get that? How long will it take me to get that money back? Mm -hmm. So if my exit plan is for rent, I know I can't go very deep. I know I can't go very deep on it. If my exit plan is owner financing, I know that I can raise 10 against that property. That's my minimal down payment when I'm selling a property to owner financing. So I'm looking at the arrears. How much is it going to cost me to raise that? Now that 10%, I will not exceed 5% of that. Uh -huh. So in essence, if it's a hundred thousand dollar property that that's owed a hundred thousand, it's $10,000. I know I can raise 10 grand against that property relatively uh -huh. easy. So would I use all 10? I really don't like to, but if we can get in and kind of negotiate some of the stuff that we used to be able to do in the past, you know, the forbearance and all that, all that stuff that we hate to talk about. Uh, certainly we will do those, but I'm primarily looking at, how far behind and how quick can I get my money back on the property? Awesome. Because that number one question is what, how much can the property afford to pay as an investment? Exactly. And then really my question and one of my focuses on uh, uh, being a complete real estate investor, talk about the risk of this strategy. Like oh. yourself, like it's okay. Say, you know, You've got $10 million in equity or you have, uh, you owe $500,000 in debt. 
What is the risk to you and your family by exercising this strategy? Well, certainly the biggest one is default. Got it. Both sides. So uh, there's always a greater risk. I'm a firm believer in having some reserves on every single property that you buy subject to. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on your disposition strategy. For owner financing, I want six months with reserves on every property. Why? Because you cannot start foreclosure proceedings until they're three months behind. So you still have to feed that payment. So six months reserves. Uh, lease option, of course, we can evict them and do all that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm looking at the risk size. There's the boogeyman that's always in a room and every single expert out there on Facebook and the creative real estate forums will tell you about the do on sale clause. Uh, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. The 30 plus years that I've been doing this, I've never seen one call due. Uh, I've counseled a few people that have had letters, but it was because they screwed up. Mm -hmm. So you do what you say that you're going to do with, with that and so forth. But in my world, it is the default is the biggest concern that you should because it can, it can have a domino effect. One of my other questions to that is like, Jonathan, mm -hmm. I, I don't really have any money. I really, I can't risk the, uh, the $2,500 I have in savings. So I can't put down these big down payments. So maybe I'm just not a good fit for this strategy. How do you respond to it? I would say that that could be okay, but you should start working with options. You know, you option to buy a property subject to and do not exercise that option until you have somebody that can step in bring in a financial partner bring in somebody like myself and like you that might be interested in that property or bring in somebody that you know that might be looking at a property like that that needs owner financing that has that 10 percent to put down mm -hmm. Got it. okay and so let's just i'm gonna make you give a freebie away here so okay. sam I, i'm a student in your 20k club and uh, Jonathan, I, I'm, I'm limited on money, but man, I, I will go knock on a thousand doors. I'll make a million phone calls. Give me a game plan right now to get a list of leads that I can work. And my goal is to help identify a deal and then call you. What, so what's my fastest path to do that for a guy like me or a gal? Fastest way right here is you must have your pitch down. You must know what you're wanting to do. The fastest thing right here, and I'm sure everybody has one of these, is a contact manager. Every single person that's in your contact manager needs to know what you're doing. That is rule number one. Make it a goal to contact 10 people per day in your contact manager and tell them what you're doing. I'm not telling them to go in there and say, hey, I'm in the newest MLM program. It's not, we're talk not what we're talking about. We're telling them that what type of value that you're able to bring them to the marketplace. So once you do that, you start to get comfortable telling people about your business. You're standing in line at Kroger or Publix in our area, tell them about what you're doing. Driving for dollars. Those are the freebies right there. In our area, Rick, Craigslist has hit like, you know, we don't even, we don't even put stuff on Craigslist anymore because it's just yeah, a, we, we, it's we pretty not, much, you know, it's not, it's just so, it's every scammer in the world. So driving for dollars, reaching out, Referrals. Your circle of influence. Yep. Um, any other ideas quickly offhand for that? I'm talking well, about the short guy. Well, the, the short the short one is that. I mean, we're not going to talk about doing uh, flyers and that kind of stuff because that takes money to be able to press print. I mean, we can go into a guerrilla marketing strategy altogether, uh, which I've posted in our 20K club, and I may, may even have it in our subject two group where I did like a 13, 15-minute video about that. Uh, the thing that you do, though, is to be consistent with what you're doing. Be yeah. consistent. Consistency is what kills in this business. You must do actions every single day. I learned this thing the other day about the rule of 54. Rule of 54 is to contact 25 people per week. Mm -hmm. just, contact, just talk to 25 people per week. Write 25 letters per week or postcards based on your demographic. And then attend four functions, four type of networking functions. Got it. If you just did that, yeah. getting out to meet people and so forth, that's free. Sure, your networking functions may cost you a few bucks and look a few stamps and envelopes, but that'll certainly get you out there. Yeah, go out, go out and meet people. Don't do Zoom meetings. Yeah, don't do Zoom meetings. <laughs> Biggest thing I could tell you, gals and guys, if you are going to get out here and start putting some signs out and so forth, answer the freaking phone. Please do so. 
I've been, I've been traveling quite a bit and I go into these areas and I make it a point to call investors because I want to see, I want to meet investors. Some investors, you know, like, like uh, Rick and I, we have a little bit of an online presence and so forth. I want to meet people. I want, yeah. They never answer phones and they do not return the phone calls. I don't know why. It just drives me absolutely crazy. I agree. Me crazy. I agree. It's my biggest pet peeve. Uh, uh, once we started outsourcing our phones that I've tried it four times. Yeah. Got massive bills, revenue went way down, and uh, all you do is got to test it, and uh, it's painful. So, who's ever answering your phone, and uh, quite honestly, who's ever going out on an appointment, they better have extreme buy in to your plan and your mission. So, why people outsource salesmen for the most important task? Mm -hmm. Outsource whatever you can, paperwork and stuff, but when you go meet with people, Get your pitch down. We talk about knowing what you're saying. So talking with your uh, friends, family, circle of influence, and just freaking rehearsing it because you can't. We, it's going to cost you customers if you rehearse on them. <laughs> right. So I always told my salespeople when I did that is if you don't know the answer, tell them the truth because it's just easier. Because if you lie, you're going to go down a pigeonhole and you're going to get it. It's going to end badly. So there, there's a nice way. I said, listen, let me just check with my partner. Like. He knows everything there is about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll get you that answer. Can I call you back in an hour and a half? And I'll get you, or you just call him right there. So just always tell the truth. Everybody, so what do you think, what do you say to the guy who goes, I'd like, okay, I get my pitch down. I understand what I'm doing. I'll identify it. I just don't know how to do the paperwork and all that stuff. So I, I probably shouldn't um, attack this strategy. What do you say to them? That's a tough one because paperwork's gonna be different in every state. Correct. Uh, so, I mean, purchase and sale agreement is a purchase and sale agreement. There is no subject to contract. It is an acquisitions strategy. So put an addendum to your state promulgated purchase and sale agreement of what you're going to do. Uh, there is a whole litany of a way to close these things. Either you're going to take it to your personally LLC, or put it in a trust, yeah. do one of those 15 <laughs> different other ways of closing transactions. That paperwork is going to be differently. So, I would strongly urge you to maybe contact somebody within your local real estate investors association, or maybe a real estate attorney. And I'm going to tell you, I've had the fortunate in my lifetime to, tra to train two real estate attorneys here in my area on how to close subject to transaction. Cool. So, uh, one of them's dead, but the other one's still alive. <laughs> uh, the, the so last thing the, the subject to, can it work theoretically on any type of real estate? Absolutely. It can. I've done commercial it's quite prolific and commercial, right? I mean, that's yes, how they do stuff. Yep. So why not do it in uh, residential? And then, so guys, just to sum it up, you, you get, you can offer a higher number in theory. It, it's correct. Um, you're offering a solution. Most investors don't know how to do, and you can get, in my opinion, in a deal with little to no risk and really maximize the cash flow. Am I correct? That's correct. Um, and then most of the marketing strategies, if, if I'm correct, follow suit of what a traditional real estate investor wholesaler does anyways. Absolutely. You just need to learn to identify those opportunities. You need to identify those opportunities and be able to look at different demographics. Yeah. Because that's really what it is. You know, I'm not going after the, the 30 to, you know, the 40, 40 50%, 60%, 70% equity. That's mm -hmm. not my wheelhouse. Yeah. used to be, but you know, Ruth and I right now, it's my wife. We're solely focused on subject to an owner financing. That's all we're doing. That is all we're, because we have our end game uh, uh, being planned out for us. And then, um, you know, whenever a market shift comes, eventually it'll come. And by the way, nobody knows when it's coming because right. for full disclosure, I planned on a market shift from after 2014 and here I am five years later mm -hmm. and it's going off the rails. So, um, what, what happens in a market when the market shifts? So defining a market shift, meaning um, it's a buyer's market. Everyone's competing on price. Does it make this option more attractive? And are the deals easier to get? And is it harder to sell? Well, if we're in a buyer's market, it's certainly hard. It is harder to sell mm -hmm. uh, because the people with equity, can, they can, what can they do? They can cut across, be able to get to that bottom. Uh, it's much easier to buy in a buyer's market. Okay. So would, the idea would just to get, you should be able to get more favorable terms. All right. Absolutely. Every single time. 
So it doesn't uh, matter if the market's up or it's down. It's just a matter of which side of the uh, court you're playing on, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. It's just to an all real estate investing guy. So if you're trying to time the market, if you're not in it, you're never going to win it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So you guys know I do on the cash side a lot, um, you know, assignments and like the whole nine yards. So like, a Rick, you know, the market, yeah, it's harder to get a deal now and we spend more. But depending on what your risk level is, we also maximize the profit. Mm -hmm. On the other side, when it flips to the other side, you can roll a quarter like down the aisle of, of your local market and they're everywhere. Um, but so those of you that have been beaten on buyers for the last three years, you got to start forming some relationships because buyers remember and they'll come back and they go, I remember when you maybe sit in front of an auction and you, I didn't get the property over $2,000. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's always like coming and going. And if you want to get relationships with agents and stuff like that, you can't do that to them because they feel like you're just, every time you call, you're going to waste their time. So right. Right. don't wait for the market to get timing. Um, I And the thing is, I've noticed like every guru is like, oh, we're, we're going to do, now we're going to do lease options. Here's the, here's the ticket, what I found. Just keep doing them the entire time. And then you come better. So when the market shifts and like that's a strategy, then it's natural for you. You don't have to like relearn it. They mm -hmm. work in an upper, up and down market. So why stop doing it? So, right. and especially for the guy who's spending a lot of money on marketing, my God, you are missing. Like, yeah. like there's only so many people with, you know, 50% plus equity. Mm -hmm. in the house. So like how many people are you kicking to the curb? So just an idea, like you can change up a little bit of your like marketing strategy. Um, but that's it. So any, any uh, last last minute tips and we're, we're going to wrap this up. I really appreciate all your time. Absolutely. Rick, the biggest thing I want to tell your, tell your people is wait, don't wait because you can't restart tomorrow, but you can start today. Just don't get in, get in the game, find somebody that you can work with, you know, such as Rick, you know, find somebody that you can just like jump in with both feet and you know, just run with it. There's an old saying that says, build a bicycle while you drive it, ride it. And that's true. You need to do that in this game because you're going to take some licks. You know, I still take licks every single day. I still have that worst deal that I've ever done in my head. Keeps playing that tape over and over and over again. But you will never get there if you do not get started. Awesome. Start. And remember, this makes you a more of a problem solver and you offer more value to your customers. If you start out wholesaling, that's great. But what I say is, you know, you can only run that hundred yard dash so long. At some point you're going to have to pace yourself and stop chasing like the latest gimmick. This is not a gimmick. How long's, um, how long's uh, creative financing been around? Oh gosh, I've got a couple old books here that are dating back in the late fifties. Yeah, no. so, so since the start of real estate, um, when people get out and, and you get some government entities out of stuff, you can come up with solutions. Right. You're not stuck. Like a lot of people think you got to do with the banks, you got to do with the title companies. There's a time and place for everything. But um, I try to teach being a complete real estate investor. And I, I can't teach this in a weekend. I can't teach it in a month. Um, you, you've got to get with someone and at least, in my opinion, get on at least a one-year program. So if those guys, what I'll do um, in the bottom of this, I'll, I'll have Jonathan send me, I think I have a link um, for your club. So I'm part of his deal. Like I pay attention and uh, Jonathan's not hard to find online. He posts the incredible content. He's got a huge library and uh, he's been around doing this a long time. So, um, and these are the values of like doing networking. Like now I had to go through hundreds of people to find people like Jonathan, probably thousands is more like the word. But like when you found him, like I've known him since 2003 is when I first met him. So that's what? 16 years. 16 years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. And I remember I walked in. I was just, Jonathan's just like, he used to ramble off stuff. Like, I'm going to follow this guy around. And <laughs> we used to go get a cup of coffee or get like lunch and then just talk. And still we sit down today and we go, listen, I got a half hour every time. And then like three hours goes by. Yep. That conversation where like you got to pee so bad, you, but you don't want to get out of the chair because you're going to miss content. Yep. Same here. <laughs> so if you can find people like that, grab a hold. And Jonathan, I'm going to be honest here. He's very accessible, but mm -hmm. 
like he's not out here like to waste time. He wants to really help people. And so he's offered like a no brainer solution. Um, I think it's phenomenal. Um, I'm not the expert on creative financing, but um, if I ever had a question, I would go to Jonathan. And a lot of my teachings are based off of your stuff. So for full disclosure. So. Appreciate that. Well, you know, I don't really call myself a, an expert. I am a school of life. I have a mentor in creative financing still today. I've had him for 22 years. So I, you know, any time that I have that complex problem that I can't phone call away, yeah. that's it. And that's earned by trust being and be, staying in the game. This real estate business, Rick, as you know, is all about survival. That's right. it. And, and Jonathan actually does deals. He just doesn't like teach it. So his, his main, his main thing is to do deals and teach students how to connect them. And then um, I, I know a big part of your people is, they identify deals and you help them walk through it. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. That's correct. That's correct. Community, great. Um, we all have mentors. Uh, some good. <laughs> I, I, I've had a lot over my life, but I, I will tell you the first, my first mentor was, um, they made me do stuff. Um, and I took action. Now, a lot of the stuff wasn't correct. It was actually wrong, but that was way back when there were lots of, a lot of rules and, and stuff like that. So as the world adapts and changes. So um, my whole goal of this conversation is just to show you, you have to collaborate to have, to be a complete real estate investor. And if you're just doing wholesaling, it's fine. I started out under that premonition, but there's so many ways to solve a problem. And I look back at, I did a deal once, um, a, a small hotel on Hollywood beach. I had no freaking idea what I was doing and I put it together and it wound up being a nightmare. Now I still made six figures, but I could have made seven figures. If I just got, if I just learned, if I had someone that could walk me through it and I, I swore it would never happen again. So I reach out to people like Jonathan, like whenever, whenever I have a question, a lot of times I just get in the car and we just sit down and we like crush out paperwork and, and then, I don't ask Jonathan to do it for free. We come up with some sort of agreement. So like Jonathan's not scared when the phone calls. Nope. You plug Jonathan and you're not in his 20K program, don't be surprised if your email goes unanswered or your question is, uh, is, is not uh, dealt with. So I appreciate your time. Um, I will call you, um, I'll call you over this weekend or sometime early next week and we'll, uh, we'll catch up. So me and Jonathan try to catch up like once a quarter because yep. um, as I said, money is important. I love it. But like developing lifelong relationships with people that have common goals with their family. Right. Really what it's about, because I can't take the money in the real estate when I go below ground, but I, I, I can take the relationship that I walked away with and, and leave a, uh, absolutely on my kids and my family. And I do appreciate for everything Jonathan brings to the table. So I will post a link below for um, Jonathan's group. Um, if you have any questions, you can post it. I'll reach out to Jonathan and Fordham, get them answered for you. And then, um, hey, guys, creative financing, it's here to stay. What I'm telling you is you don't just need to do it in down market. Do it through your entire investment strategy. And I promise you, you'll thank, you'll thank me, you'll thank Jonathan, and you'll thank your family later. So that's it, guys. I will uh, see you online. You guys can look up Jonathan. Jonathan, thanks again, buddy. I appreciate right. it. See you, Rick. Bye-bye.